All right, everybody, welcome back into the Auburn Live Basketball Show. Appreciate everybody for joining us. I am Justin Hokinson, part of AuburnLive.com on three sports. Running solo today, my man Alan Head uh, got caught up with some things, and so um, he won't be with us today. Um, so we'll be riding solo. Obviously, we're going to be talking about the SEC Tournament Championship. I just rolled back into town from Nashville, spent a few days, obviously, at the tournament. So we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about the NCAA tournament. We'll talk about Auburn's bracket and seeding a little bit. We'll run through some of that and just kind of the, the what it all means and sort of react a little bit to this championship run that they just had. Um, we'll do all of that good stuff. Before we do, quick shout out to our show sponsor, Session Cocktail in downtown Auburn right there on Magnolia Avenue. Go check them out. They just changed over their schedule to the spring schedule. Um, so go, uh, go pay a visit to them. Happy hour four to six um and uh, probably a good time to go down there you know go down there for a baseball game if you come on a friday or saturday sunday go down before or after uh, weather's getting nice um and so uh yeah come down come come grab a drink with them before baseball games things like that um and say hello to the good people there at session cocktail you don't have to wait and sit, sit at the bar sit in the lounge um kind of lounge seating um couch seating all that good stuff and so uh, we appreciate them being a sponsor of the show as well as GameTime.co. Go check out GameTime.co. Download that app if you have not. Last-minute tickets for comedy shows and sporting events, things like that. NCA tickets would be a great way to go about that if you're thinking about going to Spokane, Washington, or if you end up, you know, if you're thinking about even Boston in two weeks, if you're saving up for that trip, um, if Auburn can make it. Uh, go to GameTime.co and uh, download the app. War Eagle. Use the promo code War Eagle and you get 20% off your first purchase. Um, and so, uh, they're, they're, they're an awesome, they're an awesome, uh, website. If you, by the way, if you go to another app and, and find tickets cheaper after you bought them from game time, there's a way to go in game time and get like a refund. They'll refund you the gap, you know, the difference, the money, they'll refund you that plus some. So it's kind of a, it's just really a guarantee that you will get the lowest price with game time. So go check them out, gametime.co, and then, um, go download the app, um, if you can. All right. Let's talk a little Auburn basketball, SEC Tournament Champions 2024. How about that? Um, man, what a time in Nashville. Uh, I mean, listen, I was in Nashville. Let's say I was in Tampa two years ago, right, with the Jabari Walker team. And a bunch of Auburn fans made that trip to Tampa. And I, I was I felt so bad for them. And I know Bruce Pearl did as well, that, that all those Auburn fans traveled to Tampa with that team, and they lost the first game pretty disappointing um you know and then of course last year in nashville pretty good contingent of auburn fans although auburn was the seven seed in that um but i just think back to tampa when auburn had a really good team and there was a lot of people that traveled to that and they were just they came away disappointed man this weekend was was very different tons of auburn fans were there they just every game there were more and more um, which is bound to happen that friday game good contingent of auburn fans really solid crowd saturday a few more and by Sunday, listen, if you weren't in that arena, it was incredible. I mean, I think that arena holds about 17-ish thousand people. I mean, it's pretty close to sold out. I mean, I, I mean, there, you know, there's some seats that were that were there, but I mean, I, I'd have to think it was 95% full. Um, certainly 90. I'm thinking closer to 95% full. And man, I mean, you there had to have been over nine. I'm thinking about Neville and the 9,100 Auburn fans. There had to have been over that. There, there had to have been. You know, let's say there were 16-5 there, whatever. I mean, there had to have been, I don't know, 10, 11 for sure, 1,000 Auburn fans. I mean, there were some Florida fans, but not a ton. And there weren't, you know, there was a little bit of Kentucky mixed in, a little bit of Tennessee, just people that go and enjoy the game. But there had to be 10,000 Auburn fans in that place. And when Auburn, um, early in the game, it was crazy. The energy was insane. And then the Micah, um, hand logged and injury really kind of just reset the whole game. That was such a tough deal. But when Auburn started to make that run in the second half, when when Trey Donaldson hit a three, and then they got a steal and Denver Jones dunk, uh, and th that little run right there was unbelievably loud. I, 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 if you weren't there, I wish you could have been in there. I mean, it was deafening. It was unbelievable. And I give a lot of credit to the Auburn fans that showed up. They didn't just show up to – they didn't just show up to watch. They showed up to participate. And sometimes at Neville, I think the fans can take it for granted. Like the students are really loud, but I think sometimes the fans can sort of take it for granted that Auburn's just going to play well in Neville and the team will create the energy. And I thought the team definitely did that in Nashville. But, man, I thought the fans, like every opportunity, 
to get loud, they they were using it. They weren't sitting on their hands. You know, if Auburn made a three, if Auburn went on any kind of little small run, if they needed to stand up and be loud on defense, they did it. And so I just really commend the, the fans that were that were there because they were a big part, man. They were loud, loud, loud. And when Auburn was going on that run, it was unbelievably loud. It was deafening. It was really cool. And I and I said on on X, I posted it 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 makes you kind of if you're it makes you appreciate what Kentucky's had for so many years. And I said it, and then of course Bruce Pearl says it afterwards. But it makes you think back to you know why they called the Georgia Dome Catlanta when Kentucky was just running rough shot, and all those Kentucky fans would make that trip to Atlanta every year. And even recently, I mean, even in Nashville, Tennessee fans are obviously flocking in there, and Kentucky fans still do. Although Kentucky hasn't really made a run in that tournament in the last however many years, I mean, they haven't won a tournament, and I don't know when the last. Time. I think Kentucky may have won. Maybe they won the. Maybe they won eight, 17 or something. or I don't, I don't know. It's been a while since Kentucky won a tournament. But um, th- that type of home court advantage just makes you like realize, oh, no wonder Kentucky's won so many tournament championships. They're, they've always been the better team. But then their fans are so incredible that every time they're playing a tournament game, it's a home court. It's a home, it's a home game. Um, so shout out to the Auburn fans that, that traveled. It was, it was really cool to experience. And um, – that that Sunday championship game was absolutely a home court advantage. I mean, Florida went on a little bit of run to pass that. That crowd was a massive part, I thought, in spurring Auburn on. So Auburn wins that game, um, 86-67, really ran away with it. Um, obviously, the injury to Han Logton was, was tough. That was a big deal, can't be overlooked. That guy had five blocks and three steals in the first game. Him going out was a big factor. Janai kind of, uh, Janai Brim went off, you know, really after that. And Janai had a pretty good game in Gainesville, an okay game, but Without uh, Micah, that was tough. And then Riley Kugel, for some reason, didn't play for Florida. Not sure what happened there. He scored 22 in the first game. So it was a little bit different Florida team. But I do think the way Auburn was playing, Florida playing four games in four days, even if Micah stays in that game the whole game, um, I I still think Auburn wins just because I think Auburn was clicking. Could have been closer. But certainly without those guys, um, it was pretty much all Auburn minus three-ish minutes in the second half. Um, so yeah, fourth championship under Bruce Pearl, second tournament championship, second regular season championship, and just and all in different years, by the way. A regular a, a tournament championship, a regular season championship, they're all in separate years um of the 10 years, the four different years. So, and then of course you had the team that finished second that didn't get a chance to play because of the, the COVID cancel. So um, what an incredible three days. Auburn beats three NCAA tournament teams. I can't remember who. I'm sorry. I cannot remember where I saw that. I saw it on X, but I don't remember the handle. I, I wrote that it was that Auburn had beaten three NCAA tournament teams, but somebody looked it up and said that that hasn't happened since 2005, that the SEC tournament champion has beaten three teams to win the title, and all three were tournament teams. Generally, that first game, you know, right, is against, is against a bubble team or maybe a team that doesn't make the NCAA tournament, and then maybe the next two are. But the SEC was so good this year. You got eight teams in, and every, you know, Auburn's the first team in almost 20 years to go on a three-game run against three NCAA tournament teams to win the SEC championship, and two were blowouts. And they ran South Carolina out of the gym and ran Florida out of the gym. Mississippi State was was a battle just because matchup wise, they're, that's what they're going to do. So amazing three days for Auburn. Boy, it's hard to find a lot of negatives. Um, point guards played really well. I talked about Aiden and Trey, and sort of what they did in um, in Nashville. They're really coming along. I wrote about it. If you haven't gone to AuburnLive.com, go check them out. I put a bunch of brief thoughts up, just kind of about um, everything going on tournament and sort of what Auburn just did in the in the uh, SEC tournament, all that good stuff. Um, But you look at Aiden and Trey in Nashville. They combined for 39 points, 17 assists, and six turnovers. So 39, 17, and six in three games from your point guards. And then if you extrapolate that out to the six-game winning streak that Auburn's got going on, 72 points, 34 assists, and 10 turnovers in the six-game winning streak. That is winning basketball from your point guards, and that's what we've talked about. Like, you don't need Aiden to be a superstar. You don't need Trey to be a superstar. You need them. You need them to combine to be a really good to 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 have really good production, and they are right now. They have really good production. Trey, man, Trey was fantastic on on Sunday. Hit a couple of big threes, controlled the game really well. 
Um, and so those two guys right now combined are doing their job and they're playing at a pretty high level for a freshman and sophomore. Chris Moore, man, what can you say about Chris Moore coming on? Uh, Chris Moore in three games in Nashville, 18 points, 11 rebounds, no turnovers. And his box score plus minus was plus 11, plus 11, and plus 16 in those three games. Since Lior Berman's injury, Chris Moore has 25 points, 16 boards in his last five games. 25 and 16 in his last five games. He only he only had 11 points and 19 rebounds in the previous 16. And Bruce Pearl called that. He absolutely called that. You know, when we talked to him that week after the week after Berman's injury, he said, I think Chris Moore is going to rise to the occasion. I think he realizes that he kind of missed an opportunity and didn't take advantage of starting. And I, 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 they talked about it because I think he's going to come out with a new sense of urgency, a new hunger. And he absolutely has, especially on the offensive end. He's just more confident. He's not a bad player. He really isn't. I've been to enough practices. I'm telling you, he is an aggressive player. I remember going to practices in the Jabari year where Chris Moore was playing a ton of scout team with, with, with that group. And Chris was, Chris would play, Chris was a role player, but he was the guy that would kind of roll over and he would play a decent bit of scout team. Cause he was kind of that 10th or 11th man. And so him playing on the scout team was good, man. I'm telling you, I went to some practices where him on the scout team against Walker Jabari, that whole starting group and Chris Moore dominated. Like I watched it happen. I watched Chris Moore lead the scout team to wins that year um, because he had just, I mean, when he gets on and aggressive and he gets fired up, he is a bull trying to keep, you know, off the glass um, and things like that. So it was good to see Chris get back aggressive because he's got some ability and he's got some jumping. He's got some leaping ability and um, he's such a hustle guy. He just lost his confidence in there. I don't know if he kind of wasn't sure where he fit, fit into this team. You know, he was starting, but I think he thought, well, I'm starting, but, We've got Jana and we've got Jalen and we got Denver. And I sort of feel like Chris um, took a back seat, you know, unselfishly, but he sort of took a back seat. Like, I don't want to, like, he didn't want to try to take away from the better players. And he probably took too much of a back seat and he became, um, you know, just a, just a guy that lost a lot of his confidence. So it's great to see him get that confidence back because he 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 makes a difference he absolutely makes a difference off the bench um what else stood out in nashville janai was fantastic obviously denver continues to play really well dylan auburn's defense was really really good right i mean what they held uh state to 66 florida to 67 south carolina scored what did south carolina score 50 something so you know some really good defensive games um up in nashville they gave up, I think, five threes total. I think South Carolina hit two threes. I believe Mississippi State hit two, and Florida hit one. That's it. I think five of 27, I believe, is what those three opponents were against Auburn from the three-point line. And the Florida number is wild. Florida hit 14 threes against Texas A&M. Uh, 14 threes. Shot 54%, and they hit one against Auburn. And not only that, but they shot 10 less which could, you know, part of it could be a little bit of an energy thing. But part of it, I think Auburn's defense was just extending out. They were doing a much better job of jumping and blitzing those ball screens and not letting guys come out and get decent looks. And they just, they, they were, they'd rather those guards, if you saw early in the second half, the guards started attacking downhill. Auburn would rather that happen than giving up good looks from three. And so, um, you know, Florida shot 10 less threes than they normally do. So Auburn just was not going to let that be a part of the game plan. Um, and so give Auburn's defense a, just a massive amount of uh, – yeah, South Carolina scored 55, Mississippi State 66. And Florida 67, and I wrote about it, you look at the analytics. Um, the, the defensive game against uh, South Carolina and Florida, that was two of the top five defensive performances of the entire season. That happened right there on a neutral floor in Nashville. So this team's clicking. Uh, this team's clicking. I talked about it before the before the postseason. I said, listen, this is as balanced a team as Bruce Pearl's had. I don't know how the matchups will shake out. I know what I don't know what'll happen in the NCAA tournament, but this is as balanced a team as as he's had. I think it's his best team. I realize that the Jabari team had two games better in league play. They're right now, I think, a game. They're, they're, that team won 28 games. This team's sitting at 27. So this team could tie them for overall wins. 
But, man, I think the league is tougher this year, and they won two less league games. But I think the league's tougher this year. But I, the, just this, the way this team is made up, they have, I think they've been the most consistent team that Bruce Pearl's had at Auburn. Final Four team, man, people forget that Final Four team was up and down. Until the very end of the season, they started up. Yeah, Final Four team went to the went to Maui, right? Played pretty well, beat Xavier, beat Arizona, and lost to Duke in a pretty competitive game. Um, and then that team, I think, played Washington in the beginning of the season. Washington came to Auburn as a top 25 team, and Auburn blitzed them, and then went to Maui, played competitive, played Duke competitive, played well early. But then when it got to the middle of the season, that Auburn team was not playing up to their ability. That team went to NC State and lost in the non-conference, if I remember. Um, Lost, I think, the first SEC game at Ole Miss and was just kind of like, you know, messing around. I mean, they finished 11 and seven, but I'm pretty sure they won their last four. So they were, they were seven and seven in league play at one at one point, that final four team, and then turned it on. I thought the, I thought the, uh, the team, the, the, the first regular season championship game, that team was pretty electric all season. Didn't play necessarily the schedule, but that team was pretty dominant. Won thirteen, went thirteen and five in the league, but then, but then down the stretch faded. Right, tournament one and done, and then barely squeaked by Charleston. What didn't wasn't playing that well. The Samir team that finished second was fantastic on defense, but was very offensively challenged. Had a ton of close games. I mean, at one point, I think that team won three overtime games in a row. So, again, not nearly as dominant as this team, and not nearly as consistent. They just played really good defense and kind of just found ways to win. They had a bunch of seniors on that team. And then you go to Jabari and Walker, and that team was really, really good on defense, but that team relied heavily on Jabari on offense, heavily. And once teams sort of figured out, okay, we're not going to let Wendell come downhill and throw lobs and all this stuff, once they sort of figure out a way to attack the ball at the start, it just it threw everything off. It threw everything off. And so that team didn't have enough weapons and didn't have enough versatility to sort of change with that. This team does. This team does. They've got enough weapons. Aiden and Trey are doing a good enough job. Now, there were a couple games, right, like where Aiden and Trey struggled and you saw. But for the most part, this team's got a lot of Denver could bring the ball up the court. You've got somebody like Chad that can handle the ball. Jalen can handle the ball. And so it's just there's just more weapons and the way the offense changed this year with sort of the five out stuff. It, it changed a little bit, not nearly as much high ball screen like you saw with Wendell and Walker, not nearly as much of that. So more more like get the ball started at the elbow and then facilitate from there. Um, and so you're not allowing them to come up and just trap your point guards as much. So anyway, I, I just think this team is so much more balanced in, in, on offense and defense and they're dangerous. They're really, really dangerous. They could they could shoot well from th they could have a bad night from three and still beat you. Because they've got a down low game, um, you know they can obviously play defense, create steals, um, and all that good stuff. A, a bench that's always contribute. Jalen could be off, Cheney could go on. You know Denver could be off, KD could go off for ten or twelve. Um, you know Trey could go get you ten, Aiden could go get you ten, Chad Baker could get, could go get you eighteen, um, Dylan could get could get you eight off the bench. So it's just a really good team peaking. I think at the right time, the exact right time. Uh, I'm interested to see. You have so much momentum. You know, think back to that Final Four team, wins four games in four days, travels out, and barely gets by New Mexico State. Barely, right? Barely. And then goes on the run. So I think that's something to think about as we start thinking about the NCAA tournament. You have these days off, and it kind of resets. I do, I, I, I do think it's beneficial that Auburn had this run in Nashville. They should go out to this neutral site game and be comfortable and ready to roll. But – New venue, NCAA tournament, it's always that first game. So um, I could easily see that game being a little tight at times against Yale. Um, that's a game you just want to win. You know, you don't want to squeak by too bad, but just get by that game, get it under your belt, and then see what happens. <clears throat> um, as it pertains to Yale, look, Auburn's better than Yale. Yale had a buzzer beater, won, won the Ivy League. Good team, good coach. They'll They'll shoot some threes. Their deal is they're going to slow it down. They have one of the slowest tempos in the country. One of the slowest tempos in the country. And really, that's about, they don't do anything unbelievably well. Uh, they don't give up a lot of offensive rebounds. So, like, you know, offensive rebound percentage is very low. That they're, they're a good defensive rebounding team is what I'm saying. Um, but that's kind of it. And then, they're, and then the rate, they're going to, their tempo, they're going to slow it down. So, 
it's going to be a game for Auburn where defensively they're going to probably be guarding a long time because Auburn guards a lot too. Auburn can create steals, but Auburn's really sound in how they guard. Like they, they just make you work. They don't have a ton of breakdowns. And so <clears throat> sort of looking at that game, I would expect I would expect that to be – I would expect it to be a little slower game, possessions a little slower. Kind of, kind of like – if, you know, if you think back to the Vanderbilt games, Vanderbilt sort of the same way. Vanderbilt uses the whole shot clock. And so those possessions on that end took a long time. And so one of the keys in those games were was Bruce was saying on the other end, you know, we just need to be smart on offense because once we shoot it, if we don't get the rebound, we're not getting the ball back for 30 seconds because they're going to go down. They're going to take the whole shot clock. We're going to play defense. And so I think it's one of those deals where offensively for Auburn in this game against Yale on Friday at 315, by the way, 315 Central on TNT. I think it's a game where defensively play your game, be patient. Don't worry if you're playing these long shot clocks, play your game. But I think offensively don't feel the pressure to go down there and jack up quick shots and feel like you got to score because you got to pick up the pace because if you start missing shots, you're going to go back down and play defense for 30 seconds. It's not a game where you're going to be running up and down. So I think be efficient on offense and and let that maybe you know the more efficient you are on offense, the better chance you have of speeding up Yale because if they get down, well, they may not have a choice but to start playing with a little bit of tempo. That's how you need to try to speed him up. I think Auburn can needs to play really sound on defense, but let your efficiency on offense score and put Yale behind the eight ball, and maybe that can can speed Yale up on the other end to where they're not playing such a slow tempo. But you go down there and jack shots up and miss them. You'll play right in, right into their hands, and they'll they'll be fine to go down there, use the shot clock, slow the game down, and shorten it up. The easier you make them make it on the on the other end. So, I think that'll be um, really interesting to 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 see. Um, thinking about this SEC championship game, though, a couple of things. <clears throat> First, as it pertains to Bruce Bruce Pearl and sort of what he's done at Auburn, you know. I wrote about it and I saw some of the discussion on the board and, and on X and stuff. And I think it's kind of fun to think about, but it's hard now at this point to think about a coach that's done more for Auburn than Bruce Pearl. I think the Pat Dye comparison's fair. Obviously David Marsh was unbelievable, but what David Marsh did was most of mostly involved with the swimming team. Like David Marsh's impact on the university and the culture and the state different. Cause it's swimming. It's not football. It's not, it's just a different, it's a different kind of impact. Pat Dye's impact was big because it was, it uplifted a group of people that were like, we can compete with this other program, Alabama. So it was more than just wins and losses. I and mean, he, he elevated the entire university and the program and the fans um, in more of a social and cultural way. Bruce is similar stuff. And Bruce has got all the on, on the court champion. He's got championships. He's been to a final four. He's taken Auburn basketball to places it literally has never been. But he's also an ambassador to the university in a way that no coach has ever been. He's pushing, you know, he promotes all the sports. And, 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 you know, honestly, before Bruce, the basketball program before Bruce was in way worse shape, not just immediately before Bruce, but over the long haul than football. Like football had had some, some years in the football had a national championship. Football had some success in the past wasn't completely foreign to them, although they had, they had, you know, had gone through some struggles there in the seventies, but it, they had had good teams in the past, some good years, like foot and football was, and football was really important. Like all you needed was the right coach, like Pat Dye to come in. People were invested in football, even though they were bad, people were invested into football because that, that was the culture. That's not how it was a basketball. It wasn't just that basketball was bad. There was no culture. People weren't invested in it at all. It's not, own program he created an entire you know atmosphere of people like wanting to actually be interested in he, he didn't just create wins he created interest and investment and man that's hard to do outside of just his promotion of the university and the way he talks about all the other sports at auburn um the way he's involved in the community. You know, I I wasn't around and, and times were different right in the 80s in terms of, yeah, I don't, I don't know what Pat Dye did on the side um, in terms of outside of coaching football and, and being involved in the community and things like that. I'm sure he was. Um, but I see the things that Bruce Pearl does, you know, whether it's the the the, the children's charity 
um, or whatever, you know, raising money for cancer, like the Outlive game. I mean, I, to me, all that's part of his legacy. So when we're talking about most impactful coach in the history of Auburn athletics, I count that stuff. I, I think it's more than just wins and losses. You've got to count that stuff. It matters. Um, when you're talking about a leader of a program and a leader of, of a fan base and somebody who uplifts the fan base and inspires and encourages and what gets them to come to games and all that stuff, I think all that stuff matters. And so I think when you start to look at it in totality, boy, it's to me, Bruce is to me, Bruce is like number one. And I get that's crazy because it to me, like for a while, I thought nobody would ever supplant Pat Dye because of what he did with the football program. And without Pat Dye, where is Auburn football now? Like he elevated it to a level where you know, what, what three SEC championships in a row, mid, late 80s, things like that. Um, I just think the totality of what Bruce has done, the, 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 the way, the shape of the basketball program before he ever got there, to say it was in the dirt is, is an understatement. So, you know, he just built on his legacy. Ten years in, he's got, I think, six years left, five, six years left on his contract. We'll see how long he he sticks it out. You know, does Bruce Pearl live out his entire contract? Does he retire earlier? I don't know. Um, you know, you saw the emotion in him after that game. A lot of it was missing his dad. But he talked about this championship maybe meaning more than the others. And he said, maybe it's because it's my 10th year. Maybe it's because the league's harder. Maybe just I love this team. But there was a difference in the emotion winning this than the one in 2019. A little different. <clears throat> a little different. I think I think he thought that team was maybe going to be a little better preseason. This team maybe was a little bit unsure, but um <clears throat> I think the emotion meant, meant a lot to him. So, um that was that was pretty that was pretty special to watch, but I think is I think now Pearl is is put himself in an atmosphere of um absolute greatness at Auburn. And here's the other thing that's pretty cool to think about as it, as it pertains to SEC basketball. Bruce Pearl has I'm, I'm going to go look and see when because he was hired when 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 Bruce was hired 2014. Right after that, I could, I was going to go back and look at this before I did the podcast. But you think about it, he was hired in 2014. Right after that, Mississippi State hired Ben Howland, former UCLA coach. And at the time, that was like, whoa, Mississippi State is making an investment and in trying to go let go land a big coach. Rick Barnes comes to the league right after Bruce Pearl. Alabama goes and hires Avery Johnson. They thought at the time that was like their later ends up, ends up having to be Nate Oates. Think about Buzz Williams coming to Texas A&M. I, like, I think you could make a case that the hiring of Bruce Pearl at Auburn changed the entire league because Kentucky had run rough shot. John Calipari was there and, and was already winning national championships. I think the hire of Bruce Pearl set the tone. And look, they won three games in the tournament his first year, right, Bruce? And then they, they and then they had a couple of, you know, it took him a few more years to to build it up. But you could see the fans starting to come. You could see the recruiting starting to pick up a little bit. You knew Bruce's history, and so you knew it was like a matter of time before Auburn um, was going to get rolling, which they did in seventeen and eighteen. But I really think you could point to the hiring of Bruce Pearl at Auburn and say right after that, Mississippi State said, "Okay, we need to take a step up," and Alabama said, "Okay, we need to take a step up," and Tennessee. Um, and then later on, Musselman at Arkansas came in, I think 2019, just a couple years after Bruce starts winning. So anyway, I think there's a real, I think there's a strong case to make and look at the current the state of the league right now. And you could point back to the hiring of Bruce Pearl, elevating and pushing a bunch of other programs to start going, okay, we need to, we need to do the same thing. Auburn, Auburn is a, is a, is a, you know, um, basement dweller in basketball, and they just went out and hired a guy who is going to be – they took a chance, which I don't think they took a chance. The national narrative was that they did because of Bruce's past, but he didn't – let's be real, he didn't really do anything wrong at Tennessee. Um, but it was like a shot. It was like, whoa, Auburn just went and hired a proven winner. Like, they're not messing around. They're, they're, that, was a, that was a bold move, I think, to a lot of people. <clears throat> so, anyway, I think it's really interesting to think back about sort of the way the league is right now and how much – of that, um, you could trace back to hiring um, Bruce Pearl. But this team, man, 27 wins. The record's 30, right? With one more, they'll tie the Jabari team with 28. With two more wins, they'll tie the Chris Porter team of 90, of 98, 99. That team had 29 total wins. And then you're, you know, can you reach 30? This team is good enough, right? Three games, 28, 29, three games. They win three. They're they're tied for the most wins in the history of the, the program. For a team that's picked to finish sixth in the league, 
finishes second. They finish tied for second, and they win the tournament championship. Um, but I, you know, Bruce would tell you he thought this was a really good team. He thought this was a pretty good team that could be a really good team, and that's probably fair. I think we saw the potential. The question was, could they play defense? You saw the upgrades in offense. You thought, <clears throat> can they can they put it together defensively? Can Denver really play defense? Can he get after it? Can Trey really get after it? And man, have they come together. Chad Baker, you wondered. He's so lean. He's skinny. How's he going to hold up on defense? Can he handle the physicality? Well, yeah. He's such a savvy player. He can handle physicality, and his, his length causes people problems. Denver Jones has probably been – he's probably been the biggest revelation on defense. You knew – Janai, you knew what you were going to get. Dylan, you knew what you were going to get. KD, you know what you're going to get. And KD's – KD – makes these energy plays, but KD can also have mental lapses on defense. But KD, but he but he makes up for it when he makes some of the plays he's on defense. But Denver has absolutely stepped up to the plate in a huge way on defense. Like he's a he's a like a legit lockdown guard. I mean he gets beat every now and then everybody does, but he has become fantastic on defense. Fantastic. I think if you think about this team, there's a lot of different ways to point in terms of why they're successful and maybe why they overachieved Denver. You can make a strong case. The, the development of Denver, you go back, remember the beginning of the year, we watched this team and we watched Denver and we're like, where's Denver Jones? This guy that, that was 20 point scorer coming to Auburn. Where, where is that guy? And, and look, I, I won't name names, but I talked to people on staff that, you know, I would probably middle of the SEC season. We're like, we thought Denver was going to be a little bit more. We thought he was going to be a little bit more. And he's, and he started to find his groove. He started to get his confidence. And then you go back and look at probably the now, now the last, you know, 10, 12 games, he's shooting well over 40% from threes, become a lockdown defender. <clears throat> he's got the confidence to drive to the basket and finish through contact like he did against Florida. He's become, and a really, really, really good player, like a lethal weapon. And I think you could easily point to the to his elevation as the team's elevation. Obviously, Chad ha has been really good, has grown in comfort. Chaney's another guy that has gotten better. And you could point and say, is Auburn the same team now? Or like Chaney has elevated that team. But I really think Denver Jones was a guy that had turned it on middle of the SEC season and became a player that that um, I think elevated the entire team and made them not just a pretty good team, but okay, like a really good team, like a really good team. But I think Denver Jones um, deserves a bunch of credit in that regard. Um, latest AP poll, AP poll came out, Auburn seventh. So Auburn will go into the NCAA tournament, number seven in the country. I was trying to see what's the highest finish. Let's see. Let's see what the highest finish for Auburn is in the AP poll. I can find it. Hmm. I was trying to look it up real quick. Let's see here. They're sitting at seven now. Oh, here we go. So they finished fourth in the 98-99 team, which that's really interesting. That team was a that team was a number one seed. Won the SEC regular season, didn't win the tournament, but that team lost in the Sweet 16. It's interesting that they still ended up fourth in the AP. That's actually wild. Um, they must that they, they were a number one seed that they finished. They got knocked out that year by um, Ohio State, and still finished fourth. And then you had the team and a team in 58-59 finished eighth. <clears throat> And then the 21-22 team, the Jabari team, finished eighth that lost in the second round. That team obviously was reached number one at one point, but they finished eighth. So this team, seventh, I mean, what does it take to finish inside the top eight? Probably a couple wins. You probably need to get to at least the Sweet 16. And then maybe. And then it just kind of kind of depends on who else from that from the top six teams in the country, who else makes it and how far they make it. But I think if you can get to the Sweet 16, potentially you could be, you know, you got a fighting chance at maybe the second highest finish in the history of Auburn basketball in terms of the AP poll, which would be really, uh, which would be really interesting. Um, you know, look, a lot's made about <clears throat> the seed. 
Auburn's the number four seed in Spokane. I, I, I don't think the four seed is um, that big of a surprise. I mean, I wrote time and time again over the last few weeks, I talked about and wrote that I thought the four seed is likely. I even wrote right before the game, I said, look, if they win the championship, could they be a three seed? Possibly, but that's by no means a guarantee. I didn't understand any of the hype about could they rise up to a two seed. I saw some of that. And I was like, there's, there's no way. I don't have a huge issue with them being a four seed. I think Auburn had an awesome year. I think the committee is going to look at a few things. They always do. Non-conference schedule, Auburn's was okay. It wasn't great. That's not all their fault. Um, I mean, look, USC was supposed to be a top 25 team. They tanked. <clears throat> you know, if USC is a top 25 team and lives up to the building and wins 20 games and you beat them, that matters. You played Baylor, really good team. You just fell short. App State was a good team. App State um, got upset, right? They got upset in their conference tournament. They should have been a tournament team. But that's a game where Auburn gambled a little bit and 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 lost. Like Indiana, when you scheduled that, you're thinking Indiana should be pretty good. They kind of made a run late, but but they weren't they weren't good. Notre Dame's terrible. St. Bonaventure, pretty good. So there's just some games in there where I think they thought, you know, I think they thought Indiana were, was going to, I think they thought Indiana would be better. They thought USC would be better. Um, and so that's not really, you schedule these games out in advance, right? Like you, it's not like you scheduled them a, a week before the season. So you don't always know. So it wasn't a terrible non-conference schedule, but I think losing to Baylor, you had that game with four minutes left, you were winning. App State, you never should have lost that game. They're good, but that was a horrendous shooting night. This Auburn team <clears throat> wouldn't lose that game today. There's two games you let slip away. You combine that with USC not living up to your billing. So anyway, the non-conference schedule was just, it was so-so, and you lost two. And then, of course, they're going to look at the quad one record, which Auburn finished one and seven. Now, quad one isn't the end-all, be-all. It matters when you're talking about these top kind of four, these top sort of 16 teams, right? That's sort of the cream of the crop. That's the elite teams. That's where you're trying to figure out of the elite teams who is more elite. And oftentimes you go to quad one because you're like, okay, well, what's your record against other elite teams or other really good teams? One and seven is tough to swallow. My guess is the committee, by the way, looked at one and seven. Well, I guess they're, did they finish one and seven? Let's see the Florida win. So they actually finished two and seven. <clears throat> so they finished two and seven. My guess is they didn't look at it and go, well, but guys, Mississippi State is one spot away from giving Auburn another quad one win. That's three and seven. South Carolina is one spot away from giving Auburn another quad one win. That's four and seven. Mississippi State finished 31. If they were 30, then if they were 30, then the home win would have been quad one against Mississippi State. If Carolina finished 51 in the net, if they were 50, the win in Nashville would have been a quad one. So literally, that's that's why it was a weird deal where you're looking at this going, well, Auburn's two and seven in quad one. Well, really, they're one spot away with two different teams of being four and seven. Now, is that awesome or amazing? No, but it's not terrible. I mean, you're talking about trying to go close to 500 against the absolute best teams you play. It's not terrible. The other stat that I'm sure that they didn't really look at is, well, okay, of the seven. Well, of the seven of those quad four losses, four, uh, quad one losses, four were true road games. Alabama at Alabama, at Mississippi State, at Tennessee and at App State, I believe. I think App State still finished um, in the top 70. Where did App State finish? I'm looking it up right now. I thought they finished. Where are they? Yeah. Yeah. They finished just inside. So that the, so you're talking about four of the seven were true road game losses. By what? Couple points at App State, couple points at Tennessee. It took 40 from Dalton Connect, a couple of points at Alabama, and everybody that went there ran, you know, got run out of the gym minus Tennessee and Florida. 
um, at Mississippi State, couple points there. So you're talking about four losses, true road losses of those quad ones were by a couple of points. You toss in a neutral game to Baylor where they're Auburn's winning with three or four minutes left. <clears throat> but again, if you do that, you're going to do that to everybody. You know, you're going to go through all the quad one wins and say, well, how close were they? And, it, you know, they're just not going to do all that work. So while Auburn's quad one record was two and seven, that number was much better than what it looks like. But the committee's just not going to do all that work. They're going to they're look at it and go two and seven. And for them, there that I guarantee you that hurt Auburn a lot in terms of being what ended up being the 15 overall seed versus if they could have been 12, which obviously 12 is still high, considering they're four and five in every computer metric, including the net. Um, I think they're fifth in the net, which is a whole different discussion, by the way. Why in the world does the NCAA have a rating? And a selection committee. Why? Why are those? Why are those different things? Why does? Why does the NCA have their own rating, which takes into account schedule strength? It takes into account margin of victory. Why do they have a rating, and then the selection committee, then like has their own sort of process? What I don't understand the point. Isn't the net the process? Like in developing the net rating, isn't that the process? You have a bunch of factors and you rank the teams, but then it's like, then you get into the selection committee and it's like they treat the net as just one part of it. But the problem is the net is made up of a bunch of parts. So then when the committee is like, well, we'll take into account the net. And then the committee starts looking at like other things. Well, then now they're cherry picking what else they're looking at. So it's almost like they're doubling up on some of the things because the net includes it too. So anyway, very odd that I understand the point of the net. Like let Ken Palm and, and Torvik T rank, which I which I cite all the time on the site. Um, let them do it if, if that's what you're going to do. Or let the net be it. And then the only thing that should change is proximity to home right? Like if you've got your 16 teams and you're going, well, but we, you know, like there is some of that involved. Like there just is like there's regions and locations. And so proximity to home does play a part, <clears throat> but past that, I, it's just, it's ridiculous that, that, uh, so anyway, the point is even if Auburn was a high four seed at like 12, which would have been like the top four seed, that's still well outside of all of the computer metrics, which are four and five, and seven in the AP poll. So like even 12 would have been high compared to where everybody else saw them. But 15 is way high. Uh, and it just it just doesn't it, it doesn't make sense. And it's weird to square that up when you ask the committee, you're saying, but you guys, your own rating system says Auburn's fifth. And you guys think they're 15? I'm not we're not talking about a five and eight or nine. So that's a weird thing um to put them 15, which that was my thing going into the championship game. I said, look, I don't think Auburn's going to get to a three seed. But what I think they have done, it turned out to be wrong. What I thought they had done is elevated themselves to a high four seed so that they're not going to Spokane. And so I thought, um, you know, I thought they could be a four seed now and go to Charlotte or Memphis, maybe Pittsburgh, which would be shorter, right? That's that. And I'm like that to me, that matters more. I mean, it matters being a four. It was important not to slip to a five. They had done that. So four, three, those are great. I, I cared more about location. Okay, they could stay a little closer to home, especially if they could get to Charlotte or Memphis. You'd actually have some Auburn fans that would travel. Um, Pittsburgh, you know, some would travel too, not as many. But I cared more about the location. That's where I think they got jobbed. I don't necessarily think they got jobbed on being a four seed. Um, <clears throat> maybe a little bit like they probably should have been maybe the 12 overall seed, maybe 11, a three seed, something like that. It's possible, but I thought the locations where they got job, you could, you could kind of make the argument they got jobbed in the seed, but then you toss in, you're going to Spokane. And by the way, it's not just going to Spokane. Auburn is top five and right. Like every computer metric, right? They won the sec tournament championship, beat three tournament teams in a row to do that. Okay. Not only do they get Spokane on a Friday, think about this. We don't know the Sunday games. We don't know the time. What if Auburn ends up playing a 6 or a 6.30 or a 7 o'clock game Sunday night? 
depending on the opponent. That and that's 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 um Pacific. So let's say they what if they get a 6:30 game, they finish at 8:30 Pacific on Sunday night and they win. It's 8:30, it's 10:30 Central. You I mean that game could end so late that they potentially could fly back early Monday morning. Just because I mean, best case, 6:30, 7:30, 8:30. Like, there's no way they're they're on a plane and leaving before 9:30 Pacific. You got to get to the locker room. You got to get changed. You got to do post game media, coach game. You know the stuff. So, what best case, you leave an hour after the game. That's 9:30 Pacific. That's a Spokane. What is that? Probably a five hour flight. <clears throat> um. Well, it's a little bit quicker. I guess you'd be going, the, the, the flights coming here would be a little quicker with the wind. But either way, what time are you getting back? You add up the, the hours lost, you're getting back some crazy time Monday morning. How tired are you? <clears throat> and so then think about it. You get back on Monday sometime. Well, then the next week games, by the way, are in Boston. But the Boston region, the, those games, are Thursday, Saturday. So Auburn could potentially play a super late night Spokane-Washington game Sunday night. <clears throat> maybe fly out Monday morning and get back Monday afternoon and then play a Thursday game in Boston, which means they're traveling to Boston Thursday, they're practicing Wednesday, they're going Tuesday. So they could potentially get back from Spokane on a Monday and Tuesday afternoon could be flying to Boston because they have a Thursday game. Like that's that's where you start to factor in and go, man, I feel like Auburn got screwed a little bit because it's not just – it's not just going to Spokane for a game. It's when is that Sunday game? And then Boston's on a Thursday. And then you're talking about what kind of quick turnaround would that be if they play a late Sunday night game? So, uh, again, got to get past that first game, Yale. We'll see what time the game Sunday is if they beat Yale. But th that that's where it's just crazy. And look, and then if Auburn made the Final Four, they'd go Spokane, Boston, Phoenix. So it's just wild the travel that they set up potentially for Auburn to try to make a run, <clears throat> but it is what it is. It, it really, I don't. It won't affect the players a ton. It affects the fans a ton. I mean, some fans will go to Spokane, but not nearly as many, right? That would have gone to Pittsburgh or certainly Memphis or Charlotte. So some fans will go, but it won't be a ton. That's just a long way to go. Players will be okay. I'm more concerned about if it's a late Sunday game, come back, travel that third that thursday game but these guys are pretty resilient but it just in terms of preparation and fan support and that and stuff like that and that's where i think it kind of screwed um auburn a, a little bit in that regard but either way we'll see how it goes they play yale and then of course they get the winner of san diego state uab which san diego state is sitting here at you know a final four team a year ago they're sitting here at 21 in the ken palm they have the ninth best defense in the country so if they get san diego state that'll be just a war That'll be a, a physical battle. Think about the way that Mississippi State game went. It'll probably look something like that. Um, they're nine and they're 62 offense, whereas like Mississippi State's set 20 defense, 60 offense. So it, it'd be a similar looking game. And then, of course, UAB would be fascinating. They have a seven footer or a good team, but San Diego State would just be a, um, I think that would look a lot like the Mississippi State game. So we'll see how that goes. Not really think you can't really think too much about UConn or Illinois or Iowa State down the road. That's you know Auburn's got two games to win, and then we'll think about that stuff. What those games could look like um, if Auburn can get by um, these first two. I feel pretty good about Yale. I mean Auburn should have Auburn's playing at a high enough level. They have the athletes, and they're playing good enough defense that they should be able to, you know, barring a disaster, get by that game. I think the San Diego State game then becomes just an absolute, um, an absolute war when you look at it um yeah i mean you know you want to look at uconn down the stretch but that's a long way away and that would be an awesome game but um we'll see how it goes but what's crazy here what's funny is talking about the seating is i think auburn got jobbed on location you know who kind of got jobbed is uconn uconn is the defending champ they're the number one team in the country they're number one in ken palm they're 31 and three uh, win the Big East regular season, win the Big East tournament. And what does UConn get? UConn gets the best number two seed in Iowa State, the best number three seed in Illinois, and, you know, an Auburn team as a four seed that just won their turn the tournament championship. That's who UConn got. All four of those teams I just mentioned won their conference tournament championship. 
the Big East, the Big 12, the Big 10, and the SEC tournament champion are all in the same bracket. So it's kind of funny. Like UConn's a team sitting here going, wait a minute, we're the number one overall seed, and we get three other top 10 Ken Palm teams in our region, all of them which won their conference championship. Um, that, I think, is kind of funny. They're going, wow, I thought maybe we'd get a little bit more of a break there. Um, but but they didn't get uh, they didn't get much of a break at all. Obviously, um, UConn the favorite in that bracket. Auburn's in terms of betting odds, um, Auburn and Iowa State are kind of tied in terms of chances to win behind UConn, and then you get into Illinois, BYU, and San Diego State. So it'll be fun. Auburn plays on Friday. We'll see how it goes. Obviously, you know last year they they play Iowa. Uh, in Birmingham and, and blitz them and then just didn't have enough firepower for, for Houston. Um, and then two years ago, same thing, play Jacksonville State right there in Greenville, beat them, but they didn't look overly impressive in that game. Like they ended up winning by 20, but it wasn't completely as dominating as you would hope to see. And then they ran into a, a Miami team that was hitting their stride and Miami really dismantled Auburn in that game. But but again, at that point, my uh, Auburn was was not the same team. Like offensively, Auburn has started to sputter. They lost to Texas A&M and Tampa, and by that time, that Auburn team was sputtering. Um, this team is is not. I think this team is literally playing their best basketball. <clears throat> not just because they are, but you talk about the emergence of Denver, the emergence of Cheney, Chris Moore getting back into the action, Trey and Aiden playing with a little bit of confidence. They are, you know, I, I hate to say their best version because I wish Leor Berman was out there, but, you know, the totality of it, it's they're probably they're the best version of, that they've been all season right now, I think. I mean, I know Auburn played really well, obviously, when they beat Alabama by 18. Um, but this is probably the best version that they've been all season. So it's a great time for them to be in in that in that uh in that space. We'll see what happens. We'll come back next week. We'll get Alan back. We'll talk about uh what happens. Either we're either we're talking about two wins and a sweet 16 team. Or we're wrapping the season up next week. We'll see. I I, uh, I think Auburn gets by third Friday. I think Sunday, if it's San Diego State, I think who knows. I think San Diego State's just that kind of team that it'll be a war and it'll be a battle and it'll be who rebounds and who makes the physical plays and who knocked that, who knocks down the buckets when they need to. It'll just it'll be kind of like that Mississippi State game and it's going to be manning up and making plays keeping teams off the glass, that kind of stuff. And when it gets down to that, man, it's just a matter of want to and will sometimes. Auburn's good enough to make a run, but some of these games are going to come down to um, want to and will and not letting the other team um, get momentum and not being able to capture it back in time and things like that. And I think that San Diego State game could look a lot like that. So we'll see how it goes. Awesome time in Nashville. Great championship run. Four championships now in <clears throat> seven seasons. For the Auburn Tigers, they'll they'll hang a banner, another tournament trophy, hang a banner, um, which is always, um, which is always fun. So, um, if you can go to Spokane, it was fun by the way talking to Bruce Pearl on Sunday. So what? So we went to the team hotel after the game. We went to the team hotel at the Westin and um, watched the selection show with the team, which was great because they announced Auburn like three minutes into the show. <laughs> So there wasn't uh, any drama, no waiting around. They announced Auburn, and uh, you know it was pretty subdued. Everybody was like, "Yeah, okay, great." You know, uh, Bruce and and Stephen, on the other hand, different. Stephen Pearl was pretty was pretty unhappy. Like, what's the point of winning the SEC championship if we're just not going to move? And he's right. Look at Iowa State. Iowa State won the Big Twelve, beat Houston by what thirty, and stayed a three. There were people. There were people talking about should Iowa State? Do they have the resume to be a one or a two? And they're they stayed a three seed, and they were they're as high as Auburn in the in, in a lot of the computer metrics, and they didn't move, and so it is weird. And I think the coaches were like, well, "What's the point of going to Nashville and winning if we're just not going to move?" I mean, you get a banner, and it matters. You get a championship and a banner, it does matter, but you play two extra games. Now, I would take that. I mean, these kids are resilient. I don't think playing two extra games is going to burn them out. Um, if anything, I think it just I think it just it builds confidence. Every game you win in postseason, it just builds confidence. Um, <clears throat> Zach mentions that Tennessee's got an easy path to the Sweet 16. They get St. Peter's, kind of dangerous than Texas, um, which, yeah, Texas has been good computer-wise, but then every, every every time I look up, I feel like they've lost big games. So, like, I don't really understand Texas with the – maybe good on the computer metrics, but I don't know that they're anything special. 
and then um, Virginia or CSU. What's which one's CSU? I wonder. Um, <clears throat> but either way, Tennessee boy, who wants to bet on Tennessee in the postseason? Nobody. Colorado State, yeah, Colorado State's good this year. Tennessee is just they're they're boy, they got the markings of a typical Rick Barnes team where you look up and you're like, really talented, really big front line, big dudes, fantastic guard in Zakai Ziegler. Who they didn't have in the postseason last year. You have a player in Dalton Connect who is a go to, the kind of guy that could carry you in the tournament. And yet they go one and done in the SEC tournament. And that team's weird too, because they played with so much energy to win the league, you know, squeaks, but squeak by Auburn, go to Alabama and win, go to South Carolina, and win like amazing three game stretch. And I think it caught up to them. Kentucky beat them. And then they just sort of had to regroup and find some new momentum. And Mississippi State came out with everything to prove and, and just had way more energy and beat him. So Tennessee's got to sort of like figure some things out. But um either way, I, I think um I think Auburn's in a in a pretty good spot other than travel. And um, man, just enjoy this team, man. What a fun team. I wrote about it a little bit, just like what a unique group of guys. Transfers coming in, mixed with some guys that have been here for four and five years that are stalwarts in the program. Mixed with a couple of youngsters, it, it's just a it is just a perfect Bruce Pearl team. It really is. It really is. Even more so than the than the twenty two team. Jabari was one of the best players in the country, similar to Aiden. But Walker was you know coming in from North Carolina, highly talented. You know at that time, Katie Johnson was a year removed from being a top one hundred player that came in from Georgia. Um, and so you did have Wendell and Seth that were that were kind of came from some. Um, College of Charleston in, in, in Eastern Kentucky. I guess Wendell was. <clears throat> um, but you had, you know, it, different. Like Denver's coming from Florida International. Cheney's coming from Division Two. Janai comes from Moorhead State. Chad Baker, this is his fourth school. San Diego State, Duquesne, Northwest Florida College, and then Auburn. Trey Donaldson, is he going to play football? Is he, he's, People are counting him out. Um. And so it's just this combination of of those guys and then guys like Chris and Dylan who have just worked their butt off for four years and become super reliable. And Jalen, it's just a cool combination of players. It's just, a, I think it epitomizes everything Bruce is about, which is working hard, uh, being an underdog. It, it's just, I think that's why he loves this team so much. They work so hard. Their chemistry is really, really good. And um, I think that's a great combination. When you have a team that reflects the coach the way this team does, it's a good combination. It's not just a good, talented team. It's a team that reflects the coach. Um, and, and, man, you, if you can get those two things aligned, you can you can do some things. So this team, obviously, winning in Nashville does that. We'll see if they can make some run, make a run in the NCAA tournament. All right, let's get out of here. That's my thoughts, man. I'm burnt out. I'm, I'm Nashville and drove back, and um, we're back at spring football on Tuesday. So we'll do spring football for a couple of days and then get ready for basketball in the middle of all that. So a um, lot going on, a lot going on. But uh, if you make the trip out there, cool. Otherwise, I guess you'll you know find a, a local bar somewhere. If you're in Auburn, go to session and watch the game on Friday and um, see see uh, see what happens. If you're listening on YouTube, make sure and subscribe, turn on notifications. Go to auburnlive.com and subscribe, please. We've had a really nice month of, of some growth, so be a part of auburnlive.com. And uh, we'll see you over on the corner message board. Appreciate everybody for joining us. And uh, we'll catch you next time. See ya. Bye.